I guess a good evening to everyone who's tuning in from uh, Europe, which I imagine is sort of where the center of gravity of this is. Uh, you'll have to bear with uh, me and some of the subsequent presenters as it is a little bit early in the morning in the US. Um, but we're really delighted to be here, and I want to take a brief moment to thank Karsten and all the organizers for putting this event together. Uh, these are great. I was a participant in the um, Azure Stack HCI days last year. Uh, I'm delighted to be back this year, and we've got a whole crew of uh, presenters from Microsoft, uh, as you'll see over the course of today and tomorrow. So uh, yeah, thank you, Karsten. Thank you to everyone who's been involved with organizing this event. Uh, I'm very excited. What I'd like to do for the next um, 45 minutes or so is talk a little bit about the roadmap for Azure Stack HCI. And in particular, I'm, I wanna try to just uh, zoom out a little bit and talk about you know, what it is that Azure Stack HCI uh, is all about. Why is Microsoft doing this? How does this fit into our strategy? Uh, what are some of the things that you can expect over the coming weeks and months from Azure Stack HCI? And maybe a few hints about things that are coming even further, uh, further away than that. So specifically, uh, I'll get into my agenda in a moment, but if anyone uh, has not uh, heard from me before or met me before, my name is Cosmos. Uh, I'm a principal PM manager on the Microsoft Azure team focused on Azure Edge and platform. Uh, so I lead the PM organization for Azure Stack HCI. I have the privilege of working with many of the presenters that you'll hear from over the course of the next two days. Uh, and it, in most cases, if I say something and it doesn't have enough detail, uh, there will be more detail coming from one of those other presenters over the course of uh, the rest of Azure Stack HCI days. Okay, so without any further ado then, let me, uh, let me dive in. So here are the topics that I specifically wanna to touch on over the course of this session. First, just a brief look at sort of what is the Azure strategy and how is that evolving and how does Azure Stack HCI fit in? Uh, then I want to talk a little bit just about sort of the basics. We'll level, level set everybody on what is Azure Stack HCI. Uh, I want to talk about some of the key investment areas that we have, some of the focuses where based on customer feedback and based on uh, what we believe makes sense for the product, we have been making some significant investments in areas like management and uh, host and hypervisor level innovation. So I'll talk about that and give a few examples. I have just a couple demos, not too many, um, but as I said, there will be many more demos from the other presenters over the course of the event. Then I want to talk a little bit about updates and lifecycle because I think that's important uh, when considering, you know, how to think about 21H2 and how to think about subsequent releases of Azure Stack HCI as well. Uh, and then I'll just touch very briefly on what are some of the things to, that we can look ahead to. So that's the agenda. Those are the topics that I'd like to cover in this session. Uh, let's dive in then and start by talking about the Azure strategy. Now, in case you missed it, the Azure strategy has been evolving. And so if you look you know, five years back at what, what was the message coming loud and clear from Redmond, right? Azure five years ago, the message was migrate to the public cloud. Uh, and uh, if you watched any keynote at Microsoft Ignite or an event like that, uh, all you would hear was Microsoft executives coming up on the stage saying, hey, we have more regions than any other vendor. But that's, by the way, that is still true. Uh, and you should definitely take your workload and move it into an Azure data center. Uh, the public cloud is the future. Uh, you know, that was it, right? That was the story. And that's changed considerably in the last few years. And if you were to listen to a, a keynote presentation from someone like uh, Scott Guthrie, who leads the Azure organization today, uh, you would hear a very, very different tone. The emphasis is uh, not on simply migrating workloads to the public cloud. Sometimes that is the right thing, of course. But really, Azure today is about helping you to innovate anywhere to innovate wherever it makes the most commercial sense for you and your business, whether that's in the cloud, and that's great if it's in the cloud, whether it's a hybrid environment, whether it's on-prem or in multi-cloud or at the edge, wherever it makes sense for a workload to be run for your organization, we wanna meet you there. As the Azure team, we wanna build tools and services that you can take advantage of wherever it makes the most sense for you. And that's a really significant change from the strategy from five years ago. And I think it's important to just start by acknowledging that because uh, sometimes I meet people who haven't been uh, paying super close attention to Azure for a few years because they think, oh, well, that's the cloud and you know, there's, there's a reason my business can't use the cloud. Maybe it's regulatory, maybe it's uh, some sort of other reason, uh, technical reason. And they say, okay, well, if it's Azure, then it's not for me. And I, I really encourage you, uh, if you feel that way, to take another look at some of the tools and some of the services that are coming from Azure, because it's it's frankly astonishing, especially if you think of Azure like the message five years ago, 
it's frankly astonishing some of the things that are being built. And in many cases, I'm willing to bet you can take advantage of them, uh, even if you sort of are the kind of person who thinks, well, I'm not really, I don't really use the public cloud very much. So I think that's an important place to start, is just with that changing strategy, at, even at the highest level in Microsoft Azure. Okay. Uh, just to emphasize, by the way, you know, you, you go to azure.com and like literally the word on-premises is, is what you see on the home page. Like there's this developer who's enjoying her $200 of credit and then there's where, where should you use Azure? And the first thing is on-premises. So uh, I, I, this is a very serious strategic shift from Microsoft. How does Azure Stack HCI fit in? I think that's a, an important uh, thing to add onto this. You know, we've got the high level strategy. Uh, given, given that Azure is really focused on helping customers to innovate anywhere, uh, it makes sense that we're actually increasing our focus on our on-premises products. And in particular, we have a significant renewed focus on Hyper-V and on virtualization and on software-defined infrastructure and edge infrastructure. One of the ways you can see that is that we've been transforming Azure Stack HCI from being simply uh, a scenario, one of many scenarios or features in Windows Server, to actually its own product line. And there are a number of things this lets us do, which I'll talk about a little bit, and you know, lifecycle and so on. But now Azure Stack HCI has grown up, basically. It's moving out from home. It's no longer just a feature within Windows Server. It's actually its own distinct product. It's a product focused on being the best virtualization host this actually has the benefit that it allows us to focus Windows Server even more on what people really use it for, which is primarily guest workloads and traditional server workloads. And this new Azure Stack HCI product has a lifecycle, which I'll cover toward the end here today, uh, which is actually, uh, I think, pretty exciting. It's much, much quicker. And so our ability to deliver innovation for Azure Stack HCI is no longer going to be every two or three years, but actually every one year. Uh, and the 21H2 feature update is a great example of that. And the reason that we're focusing more on Hyper-V and more on HCI today than we ever have in the past is because of this strategy from Azure to meet you where you are and to deliver tools and services that you can take advantage of in whatever way makes sense for you, whether it's hosted by us or whether it's hosted by you. Uh, again, this is a, a very profound shift strategically, and so you can see that in the original announcement for Azure Stack HCI when we made this transition from just being a feature of server to being our own product. Uh, the person who announced it was not me. <laughs> it wasn't my boss. It was actually Satya Nadella, the chief executive officer of Microsoft, uh, conveying the importance, if you sort of look specifically at what he said, of things like consistent management from the portal and regular feature updates. Uh, and Again, a, a very profound uh, strategy shift from, from Microsoft. Now, there are sort of two big pieces to the Azure Stack HCI strategy. So if we zoom in now onto hyper-converged infrastructure specifically, there's two things we're doing. The first is we're trying to bring as much Azure management innovation as we can so that you can take advantage of it with your on-premises clusters. And that looks a lot like ARC enabling our infrastructure by default, making it manageable from the Azure portal and building integrations with Azure management and Azure security services. So this is a huge focus for us. There's a few things that are already launched. There's a few more things that I'll touch on briefly today, and there's gonna be a lot coming over the coming months and years. And so this is sort of a theme that you can look for, is us bringing Azure management innovation. People love the management tools in Azure and bringing that so that you can take advantage of it with your Azure Stack HCI. The other big focus for us is around Azure host innovation. So I've said this uh, before, but I think a lot of people probably don't know. We actually uh, are a single engineering team here at Microsoft that is responsible for two things. We're responsible for Azure Stack HCI, and we're also responsible for the rollout of the Azure host OS. So there are more than a million physical hosts in Microsoft data centers that our engineering team is directly responsible for providing the OS, rolling out that OS, keeping it patched. Uh, literally, our team is very, very busy uh, at the same time of the month that you are, because we have a million machines that we're responsible for. And what's cool is with Azure Stack HCI, we have an opportunity to take some of the hypervisor level and the host level innovation that our engineering team develops for the Azure fleet and deliver that in a way that you, our customers, can actually take advantage of it on your own fleet, on your own servers that run on your premises. And so that's a second big theme for us that you can uh, look out for and that you'll see us doing things not only this year, 
but over the coming months and years beyond that. These are two big pieces of our strategy with Azure Stack HCI specifically as part of that overall Azure strategy. So I hope that that uh, serves to kind of frame a little bit what our team is doing, how we're thinking about this product and uh, why it makes sense that actually within Microsoft and within Azure, this product is getting more and more focused from Microsoft uh, as part of that new strategy. Okay, so let's let you know, let's talk concretely, you know, what is Azure Stack HCI? We can get into uh, a little bit less strategy and a little bit more just uh, plain and direct facts. First and foremost, Azure Stack HCI is a new operating system specifically aimed at hyperconverged infrastructure scenarios. And so it's our latest bare metal hypervisor that has built in software defined storage and software defined networking. It has a composition that's been optimized and reduced so that it doesn't have all of the other things that you don't need. Uh, and you can see here that when you install it, uh, there is clearly some shared heritage with Windows Server, but there are also clearly some differences. Uh, and over time, those differences, I suspect, are going to become slightly more pronounced as we work on bringing as much innovation as we can from the Azure host and also continuing to streamline the actual composition of this image. And so one thing that you'll see is uh, between Azure Stack HCI version 20 H2 and version 21 H2, uh, a significant uh, reduction in the number of roles and features that are there that you might not need. What you'll see in the between 21 H2 and I guess this is a reveal, 22 H2, is you'll actually see the out-of-box experience change more significantly. So it looks a little bit less like Windows. And this will be a gradual story over the course of many, many releases. Um, but I think the first sort of concrete thing to know is yes, it is a distinct operating system uh, that is specifically tailored for this scenario. Uh, now, I wanna be really clear just because sometimes uh, I, I've seen folks get confused. Azure Stack HCI runs on your servers on your premises, right? So this is, in spite of all of the talk about cloud, this is fundamentally a bare metal OS that runs on industry standard servers. Uh, you've heard from folks today uh, from some of our great partners like Dell, uh, and uh, you run this on your physical premises. But the key thing is that Microsoft is delivering Azure Stack HCI as a hybrid service. And so what I mean by that is, there are not software licenses that you need to go to buy for Azure Stack HCI. If you're an Azure subscriber, you simply bill it to your Azure subscription automatically. There's not a standalone legal agreement. There's no EULA for Azure Stack HCI. Uh, it's simply covered by the Azure service terms. There is no separate support uh, contract or support you know, price list or anything for Azure Stack HCI. It is simply covered as part of your Azure support contract if you are an Azure subscriber and you can request support from the Azure portal uh, just like you would for any other Azure service that you use. And there's not uh, versions that you need to go out and decide which one of these am I gonna buy and then do I wanna pay for an upgrade? Uh, it's an always up to date product where you get continuous feature updates included as part of the subscription fee. And so on the one hand, it's definitely on-prem. Like, I think it's very clear, right? It runs on your servers that you control and your premises, you're the administrator, you can use the management tools you like. On the other hand, in many ways, it's uh, packaged as an Azure service. And I think that's a very interesting uh, and sometimes confusing for, for folks uh, dichotomy that I, I, I'm hoping that I can clarify here. There are uh, parts of the user experience. Uh, that previous slide is very businessy. There are, there are real user experience consequences for this. Um, so like you can see your Azure Stack HCI in the Azure portal. Uh, you can request support through the portal. You can see your billing in the portal. Um, and so these are some sort of user experience consequences from the same idea, which is that Azure Stack HCI really is delivered as an Azure service. Okay, now I talked about our strategy having two important areas. The first one is Azure management innovation. The second one is Azure host innovation. And so what I'd like to do now is specifically talk about each of these. Uh, and I'll give some examples and some demos and some sort of uh, indication of what's coming next uh, for each of these areas. So I'm going to start with Azure management innovation, and then a little later we'll transition into talking about Azure host innovation. So let's start with management innovation. And the key thing to start with here is Azure Arc. Now, I'll forgive you if you find Azure Arc a little confusing. So Microsoft has been talking a lot about Azure Arc over the recent uh, years. We first talked about it at Microsoft Ignite 2019, which of course was our last in-person Ignite. Um, and in the two years since then, 
uh, there's been a ton of capability and a ton of new scenarios that have been brought to Azure Arc. So the first thing I want to do is just sort of unpack <laughs> what are all these different pieces of Azure Arc and how do they relate to Azure Stack HCI? The whole idea with Azure Arc is to enable you to manage a resource that is outside of the public cloud from the public cloud control plane. And so sitting in the Azure portal using Azure tools like the Azure CLI or the Azure SDK, you can interface with and manage resources that are actually not in an Azure data center, even though they appear like an Azure resource. That's the common thread across all of these parts of Azure Arc. But what exactly is that resource? That's what's different. And that's where there's a lot of different pieces that are applicable to Azure Stack HCI. For example, you can manage the HCI infrastructure itself with ARC enabled hosts. And that's what I'll give a demo of in a minute. Uh, for a few of you who are part of this private pre preview program, you've probably already seen that you can also create and manage VMs on the Azure Stack HCI cluster using the ARC resource bridge. This is something that we've talked about a little bit publicly. Uh, I think most folks are aware that there's a private preview going on. Uh, this is something that we'll be transitioning to public preview pretty soon. You can also manage uh, the guest OS inside of those VMs by ARC enabling the virtual machines. If you deploy Kubernetes using uh, AKS on Azure Stack HCI, you can actually ARC enable your Kubernetes clusters and then manage those using the tools that you would use to manage AKS in Azure Cloud. So that includes things like GitOps um, and Azure policy to configure the Kubernetes clusters. And there's a selection of services, including data services and app services, like web apps and Azure Functions, that you can run on Azure Stack HCI. They actually are packaged to run on top of AKS, on top of Azure Stack HCI. And by ARC enabling those services, uh, you can actually manage them from within the Azure portal as well. And so there's a lot here uh, under the umbrella of Azure Arc. And you can see that some of it is already in preview, some of it is already generally available. Uh, and really that last kind of piece of the puzzle, which is the ability to provision workloads on the fabric from the resource bridge, uh, we expect to have in public preview very shortly. So I hope that this sort of brings a little bit of like organization <laughs> to all of the different things that are possible through Azure Arc, uh, and all of which are uh, relevant and applicable to an Azure Stack HCI deployment. Now, the one that is sort of closest to my heart is managing the HCI infrastructure. And so I do want to uh, start by talking just a little bit about that one. And I'll give a, a demo of this because I think in many ways a demo is more valuable than slides. Let me give you uh, an example then of what I mean when I say that you can manage your infrastructure through Azure Arc. And specifically, I want to give a demo of something called Azure Monitor Insights for Azure Stack HCI. This is a scenario that's been in preview since a little bit earlier this year, since May. So hopefully a few of you have had a chance to see it already. Uh, but I think it's a great illustration of what the team is doing, extending the power of Azure Arc to Azure Stack HCI. Let me give you uh, an example of where this would matter. One of the problems that we hear about frequently from customers with Azure Stack HCI is that Windows Admin Center is, is great if you have a single cluster that you want to manage. But if you have multiple clusters at multiple locations, uh, it is not that easy to monitor all of them in a single pane of glass. You basically have to monitor them one by one using tools like Windows App Center. Increasingly, we see customers with many deployments. In fact, this is uh, astonishingly common. Hyperconverged infrastructure is great. One of the strongest uh, scenarios for it is branch office and edge deployments, right? Because of the small scale, because it brings its own storage and you don't need a SAN or NAS product. And so we see a huge number of customers deploying HCI at the edge and in branch offices. But of course, that means they have multiple locations. In fact, many customers already have um, like more than 10 different locations where they're running Azure Stack HCI. So how can they monitor those centrally? And this used to be a problem where we really didn't have a great solution. And Azure Monitor Insights is intended to address that problem by taking advantage of the power of Azure Arc. So let me give you a quick demo then, and uh, hopefully this will uh, be more valuable than any slides that I could show. So I'm going to start for this demo in the Azure portal, and I'm just in portal.azure.com. This is like on the public internet. There's nothing funny. 
Uh, and you can see that I have a collection of resources, including an Azure Stack HCI cluster resources. So you can see it here. It's four nodes. Uh, they're from Dell, they're PowerEdge, they're great. Um, and each of these nodes is an ARC enabled server. And this happened automatically for me because I deployed version 21H2, which as you'll hear is coming a little later this year. Now, uh, that means I have all of the capabilities of Azure Arc for each of these servers. And I also have a set of capabilities like the one that I want to show you, which is multi-cluster monitoring. So I can connect this cluster with just one click in the portal here to a log analytics workspace in my subscription in Azure. Now, notice that I don't have to leave the portal. I don't have to go uh, manually install some agent. I don't have to do something on every node. I just click that I want the logs capability right here conveniently from the Azure portal. And when that's set up, now I'm, I've done everything I need to do to monitor this cluster from Azure. Now, if I go to Azure Monitor in the portal, you'll see there's a set of resource types that Azure Monitor natively knows how to monitor. So there's like VMs and SQL, and one of those resource types is Azure Stack HCI. And so right here in Azure Monitor, again, this is not some weird version of Azure Monitor. I didn't have to go set something up that's complicated. I just went to Azure Monitor. And I can see all of the clusters that are registered with this subscription. And I can see things like the health of the clusters, the health of the nodes, the state of virtual machines that are deployed across all of these clusters, and even storage information for things like uh, data volumes and drives. So this is a lot of the same information that you'd get in Windows Admin Center. There's not new information here. But what's different is you can get to it conveniently from the Azure portal across all of your different deployments. And so if you have 10 or 100 or 1,000 Azure Stack HCI clusters deployed in your organization, you can see them all here. As you can see, there's a subscription picker at the top, so you can actually do multiple subscriptions if you want and see them all in one place. Uh, and then you can get a, an overview at a glance of if anything uh, requires your attention, right? If any of the clusters are unhealthy, if any of the nodes are down, if any of the VMs are stopped when they actually shouldn't be stopped, you can easily get that here. And then you can use tools like Windows Admin Center to drill in and actually take action uh, if you need to. So this is really easy to set up, which is a, a, an important criterion for us, um, and is, I think, a great example of how taking the power of Azure Arc and Azure Monitor in this case, we can actually address a scenario that previously we had struggled, I'll be honest, for, for many years to address, right? Uh, if you had multiple clusters of Azure Stack HCI, there was really no good way to see them all in one place. Uh, but here, with just a convenient click in the portal, you can easily do that. So this is something that we didn't have before. It's not us sort of trying to rebuild something from Admin Center here. Uh, it's really us taking that same information. It's actually the same APIs and everything underneath, um, but doing it at scale in a way where the information is pre-aggregated and cached up through Azure Monitor, through Log Analytics, and then you can see it all conveniently here in Azure Monitor. So how does, that, um, how does that work, actually? Um, you might be wondering, you know, you clicked one button, okay, that's great, but that's always dangerous, right? When someone says, oh, it's just one button click, that means they're hiding something. So how does this work behind the scenes? Uh, the, the key intuition that you need to have here is that each of these host servers is actually an ARC-enabled server. And so when you're in the Azure portal, like I just was in my demo, and I'm interacting with my Azure Stack HCI cluster resource, which as you saw is a native first class resource right there in the portal. When I click the button that says I want logs to be uploaded to a workspace and I, I you know, provide the information of the workspace, what actually happens behind the scenes is the HCI resource provider in Azure uh, is managing a collection of ARC enabled server resources for me. And those are each of my hosts. And with 21H2, when you register your HCI cluster, we automatically register each of the hosts as an ARC enabled server. So that means behind the scenes, each of these ARC enabled nodes has the Azure ARC infrastructure on the node, like there's an agent, the Azure ARC agent, the ARC connected machine agent specifically. And that agent will do things like install extensions if uh, Azure says, hey, this machine is supposed to have this extension. This works using the same mechanism as you might be familiar with already for Azure virtual machines. And so what this means is I can, you know, with just one click on the cluster, say, hey, I want this extension on my cluster. Behind the scenes, each of the nodes says, oh, okay, I need to go get this extension, and then it gets installed onto the node for me. And all of that is flowing over the connectivity established by Azure Arc, um, which you can read about, but it's, it's very nice. It's an outbound-only model, so you actually don't even need an inbound firewall port for this. 
um, the agent essentially pulls for the state in the cloud every couple of minutes and then installs agents if it needs to, um, which is what happened here for log analytics. And so just like that, without leaving the portal with a couple of clicks, I can connect all the nodes in my cluster to a log analytics workspace really easily. This is a huge improvement over how you would have had to do this before, which would have taken a lot of monkeying around, especially in a, a, a core based OS like Azure Stack HCI, where you don't have the desktop to install things. Additional points I want to make with this solution architecture here is the way that we are setting ourselves up for management at scale. And so the demo that I did showed me enabling only a single cluster for monitoring. I already had three others in my subscription that were enabled, and so I was able to show you four of them on the screen. But I only showed you, you know, going to one cluster and then using the portal to actually click like install uh, this extension, please. An important insight here is that extension management uh, and this is true of IaaS virtual machines, if you use those, is already something that integrates well with the Azure CLI, with the Azure SDK, and with Azure policy so that you can control it at scale. And this is a really important thing because it means if you have, say, uh, I mean, this slide shows three, but let's say you have 500 clusters and you actually have not set them up for monitoring, it would be really tedious to go one at a time and enable them for monitoring. And what you can do instead is just take an Azure policy apply it to the resource group where all of your clusters are and say, hey, every Azure Stack HCI cluster in this resource group or in this subscription, for example, should be uh, using Azure Monitor. And then Azure Arc will apply that policy for you. And uh, when you check back half an hour later, all of your clusters, and they're, what I really mean is all of your nodes, will be connected to the log analytics workspace that you specify. So this is really important because as we add more capabilities, uh, you don't want to have to go one cluster at a time and, and add them or remove them or edit them. And by the way, this works for editing the parameters as well. And so if you wanted to take 500 different clusters and point them all at a different log analytics workspace, that would be just a single Azure policy that you would have to apply, uh, same as rolling it out. Okay, now I, I don't have, uh, unfortunately, the ability to disclose much that is in the future, but I do want to give a pretty direct hint about something. Uh, there are over 100 extensions available for Azure Virtual Machines in Azure IaaS today. And if you if you use Azure and if you use Virtual Machines in Azure, then you know what I'm talking about, right? There are just a ton of different extensions. Uh, the pattern that you can expect is that extensions will come to Azure IaaS first, and then we will bring them through Azure Arc onto Azure Stack HCI. And so uh, today, a number of extensions are generally available for ISVMs. That includes things like uh, the Azure Monitor agent for monitoring, uh, guest configuration for uh, specifically, I guess that's the DSC extension for uh, Azure Policy guest configuration. Uh, there are some extensions that I think many in this crowd will be aware of, like the Windows Admin Center in Portal extension, which is currently in public preview for IaaS virtual machines. Uh, you can install site recovery as an extension in Azure. Uh, and there's a public preview recently announced for uh, a second uh, significant update to the run command capability, uh, where you can actually run uh, commands like such as PowerShell commands in virtual machines that you deploy in Azure. That's in public preview. So that's just a few examples of extensions that are already available to you in IaaS VMs. And what you've seen here today is the Azure Monitor extension is now in preview for HCI. And if, um, if you take my hint, you should stay tuned on uh, potentially other extensions uh, that will come to Azure Arc over time. Uh, now, there is, there is one that I think it's important to give a little sneak peek at because the team is uh, specifically working on something that many of you may already use through Windows Admin Center. And so we are working on packaging the Azure site recovery scenario as an extension so that you can enable it as conveniently as I just did for logs directly from the portal. So this is a render or a mock-up. This is not a real screenshot yet, um, but you can see similar to how there were logs and monitoring in the demo that I showed a moment ago, um, we anticipate that very soon you will be able to actually enroll a cluster in Azure site recovery and configure that directly from the Azure portal. Now, with the intuition that I gave around extensions sort of gradually coming to ARC and coming to HCI, I don't think that this is surprising, <laughs> uh, but I do just want to sort of 
give you a sense for what you can expect as the team continues to move forward uh, for each of these scenarios where there's a hybrid management service and we need to integrate it with HCI. Um, having a really easy way to enroll either a single cluster through the portal or many clusters through the Azure CLI and the Azure SDK and through Azure policy uh, is something that we're, we're very, very focused on in our team. So the demo that I showed used monitoring as an example, um, but there's a pattern here. Uh, and if you want to keep your eye out for what to expect over the coming months and years, uh, look out for this pattern of extensions coming from IaaS to Azure Stack HCI. OK, so that's a little bit about Azure management innovation. Uh, one of the things that is all, you know, ready right now with 21H2, which is that multi-cluster monitoring and a, a little look ahead at some of the things that the team is uh, able to hint that we're working on. Let's switch gears then and talk about host innovation coming to Azure Stack HCI, because I think that's pretty important as well. Uh, I've talked, I've mentioned the 21H2 feature update, also known as Azure Stack HCI version 21H2. There are some pretty significant infrastructure capabilities in that feature update that I'm really excited we are able to deliver to all of our subscribers later this year. Uh, you see a few examples of them here on the screen and I'll touch on those. There's actually a lot more as well. Um, and so if, you've, if you're paying close attention, you may have noticed, for example, that uh, if you have a 21H2 preview channel cluster, uh, you can actually change the amount of bandwidth allocated for storage repair directly from the settings in WAC. Um, that's a, an example of something that's not on the slide, but there's a lot of little things like that that um, that you'll discover, I think, as you as you take the 21H2 feature update and as you as you explore it. A number of these uh, capabilities, and I think this is an important point, are actually things that the team is either developing for Azure right now or developed for Azure at some time in the past. And so, uh, for example, the dynamic CPU compatibility feature, uh, which is one of my favorites. This has been a long standing request from Hyper-V customers. Uh, this allows you to mix and match different generations of processor within the same cluster and not have to uh, reduce them all to a punitively uh, low sort of uh, min bar for compatibility. And so actually the cluster will intelligently figure out the maximum set of processor features that it can use that are common between the processors. Um, so this is a huge deal in terms of the performance uh, that you can get in a cluster that has mixed generations of hardware, which is awesome. That's an example of something that not only are we uh, developing and bringing to Azure Stack HCI this year, actually we're rolling it out to the Azure host as well this year. Um, so this is like something that's brand new that we're bringing to both audiences, our own data centers and your data centers at the same time, um, because just like we know on-prem customers uh, often have a good reason that they need to mix hardware generations, we're starting to mix hardware generations in our own data centers. And so we developed this capability and we're able to bring it to both Azure and Azure Stack HCI at the same time. Uh, some of the other capabilities that you see here, right, the ability to assign a GPU to a clustered VM and still have high availability with that VM. Uh, network ATC, which allows you to configure cl cluster networking centrally and have it not only propagate cluster wide, but also correct for drift if something drifts. Uh, thin provisioning, which really changes the interaction model with storage spaces direct. You no longer have to worry about, did I get my volume sizes right? Uh, did I, oh, did I make that one too big? How do I balance my capacity across? You can actually be a lot more, uh, dare I say, carefree about storage provisioning um, because uh, the consequences are much lesser when you're using thin provisioning. Uh, these are all pretty significant capabilities that are coming in the 21H2 feature update. And uh, I, I, I don't think I have time to sort of demo all of them, so I'm going to just pick one that I'll give you a quick look at, um, and then you'll hear about the others uh, over the course of the event. Um, but let me just give you like a a look at one of them, and it, it, one of the nice things, the reason I chose this is it's a pretty quick demo, which is sort of the point. Uh, Kernel Soft Reboot is a technology that enables uh, the Azure Stack HCI OS and hypervisor to perform a software only restart where it actually bypasses the entire power on self-test and preboot sequence. And so this uh, enables restarting a physical host for in a scenario like doing maintenance or applying an update, for example. You can actually restart a host uh, about 10 times faster than you would normally be able to performing a classic cold reboot. Uh, and that's if that's if that sounds incredible, I mean, I agree with you, actually. Uh, we were really pleasantly surprised to discover just how effective this technique is. Um, and I can show it to you. So uh, 
in this very simple demonstration, you'll, you'll see it does not take long. Uh, I am performing a normal reboot and a kernel soft reboot on the same server, and we've sort of lined the videos up so that you can compare how long it takes. Uh, so this is a, a Dell uh, 740 integrated system. You can see uh, with kernel soft reboot, it takes just 19 seconds for the OS to come all the way back up. So I'm already here at this control alt delete unlock screen, right? The OS is ready to host virtual machines again after 19 seconds. The normal reboot, by comparison, because it has to do that entire, entire pre-boot sequence with the power on self-test and everything else, actually takes much closer to the time you would normally expect, which is like about four minutes to restart the server. And so that's that 10 times difference, right? You could actually restart uh, using KSR on the right 10 times, in fact, 12 times, uh, before the first reboot you had attempted using a, a normal classic reboot had completed. So supporting kernel soft reboot is a requirement for all Azure Stack HCI integrated systems, starting with version 21 H2 and going forward. Uh, and we're really excited for this to start rolling out to folks who've been working closely with our partners. You'll hear from Christina later, uh, some of the systems that we already have uh, gone through really thorough validation to make sure that they're able to perform a KSR and every driver and everything in the whole system is, is able to do that. Um, but I think when folks are able to get their hands on this, and start taking advantage of this capability is really going to change the experience of uh, applying software updates. Um, so pretty excited about KSR. Now I mentioned Christina, uh, and in fact, not only for KSR, but for any of these capabilities that I described in the 21H2 update, you can learn more over the course of the rest of this event uh, today and tomorrow, because we literally have sessions about all of them. And so whether it's network ETC, where Dan will be speaking, or thin provisioning for storage space direct, where Tina will be speaking, GPUs for HA with Alvin and Payment and Prasid, secured core server and rebooting in seconds uh, with KSR. All of these topics, and this is I think a testament to the strength of this event, all of these topics actually have the program manager from Microsoft who is responsible for that feature, giving a presentation over the course of the rest of today and tomorrow. So uh, if you're interested in these, which I hope you are, I definitely encourage you to stick around and watch these detailed breakout sessions. OK, now I, I keep talking about the 21H2 feature update, and I think it's a reasonable question to say, well, wait a minute, what is that and how do I get it and when do I get it? And uh, you know, these features like GPUs with HA or KSR or thin provisioning or network ATC, these are great, but uh, like, how, how am I actually gonna? How am I actually gonna receive? Them? And so, uh, with Azure Stack HCI, we've adopted a lifecycle of having regular yearly feature updates. And so, we released version 20H2 late last year. We will be releasing version 21H2 later this year, and we are already very far into planning version 22H2 for next year. And we anticipate doing uh, yearly releases. Uh, every year thereafter, as you can see from this slide. Now, the, the key insight is that because Azure Stack HCI is delivered as a service and it is packaged as a subscription, uh, there's no notion here of needing to buy the new versions. So if you have an Azure Stack HCI, you are a subscriber, you are automatically entitled to any feature update that comes out uh, that is technically able to be installed on your system. And so uh, every customer who has 20H2 today will receive the 21H2 feature update this fall uh, and the 22H2 uh, feature update thereafter and so on. Uh, and this is, I think, one of the reasons that our team is just so excited about this new product is our ability to deliver innovation on a continuous basis is uh, significantly greater uh, than it used to be when we were just a feature of Windows Server. Now, there are a number of investments the team is making across the board to actually deliver on these feature updates. Uh, some of these I think will be pretty intuitive. You'll recognize them from other products. Uh, some of them are significant innovations in the server space. Uh, unlike anything we've done before, the 21H2 feature update for Azure Stack HCI will be available as an over-the-air update, meaning you will see a notification in the product and you'll be able to install it just like you would install a monthly patch. There's actually a lot of uh, cleverness that goes into the dynamic packaging of these updates. And so when you are offered the 21H2 feature update over the air, you're not just getting some kind of a stale image that's from months ago. You will automatically also get all of the latest quality updates pre-packaged into that so that when you, when, you, when you apply it, you have a single update 
to get all the way to latest. One shot to latest is what the team calls that. And it, it's a pretty significant uh, benefit from a user experience perspective. There's also been a lot of work that the team has done to optimize how applying updates even, even works. Uh, and so one of the big breakthroughs there has been uh, reaching a single reboot. So if you've done like a Windows Server in place upgrade before, you may remember like it can take a very long time and it restarts multiple times as part of applying. Uh, that is not the case with the 21H2 feature update for Azure Stack HCI. And so when you get notified that this over the air update is available, um, not only will it contain all of the latest changes, you'll be able to go straight to latest in one shot with a single reboot and you'll be able to leave your nodes in cluster membership the whole time. Um, and cluster aware updating will actually orchestrate rolling out this feature update for you, just as if it was a monthly patch. Uh, now, I think a screenshot sometimes is, is even more useful than words. So this is a, a quick look at how this will appear in Windows Admin Center. Uh, this, some of you may have seen this already if you've used the preview channel. This is rolling out to Windows Admin Center a little bit later this fall. Um, but you, if I can call your attention to sort of the middle of the screen, what you'll see is when there is a feature update and quality updates available. Uh, the feature update is, of course, what Microsoft recommends because it includes all the quality updates also. So it's just kind of the best of everything. Um, but you will literally have this uh, radio button that allows you to select, like, do you want to apply the feature update or do you want to apply the quality update? And regardless of which one you choose, uh, it'll work the same way. So it's over the air with a notification from the Microsoft Update uh, CDN. Uh, in the same tool at Windows Admin Center. So hopefully that helps to clarify what the 21H2 feature update is. It really is unlike anything we've done before with servers. Uh, we've never published an over-the-air feature update like this. Uh, we've never been able to roll something like this out using cluster aware updating. Uh, almost everything that you're seeing here is, uh, is a significant step forward and it's uh, the work of a lot of engineers at Microsoft to bring this to reality. This is a, uh, an indication among other things of our commitment to Azure Stack HCI. I mentioned that some of the update technology here is actually being brought over from Windows Client. Uh, and I just, I find this chart really kind of stunning. So I wanted to share this with you. Uh, this visualization shows you the amount of time that it takes to apply a feature update for Windows 10 or Windows Client, uh, starting about three or four years ago, coming all the way to uh, actually a little bit into the future. <laughs> with one of the, few, the, the updates that you'll, you'll get soon on client. And so you can see the, the 50th percentile, which is the light blue line, that's the average time it takes to apply an update. It used to be about 80 minutes, meaning like an hour and a half almost. And very steadily over the last couple of years, that average time it takes to apply a feature update has come all the way down to just under five minutes is the average amount of time it takes to apply a Windows 10 feature update. The 95th percentile, meaning kind of the worst case that most people would ever experience, used to take 280 minutes, which like you have to do the math. That's almost, that's almost five hours, it's more than four hours. And that worst case time has also been, has also come down over the years to the point where it is now the same as the average time. Whether you have, whether your system is average or worst case, it takes five minutes to apply feature updates on Windows client. Now it doesn't take five minutes, it's a little, a little longer still with Azure Stack HCI with this 21H2 update, but the team that is responsible for the update innovation and the technology that's gone into client here, uh, literally they are, they are now part of the Azure Stack HCI team and they are working on bringing all of the same experiential benefit to Azure Stack HCI. So this is what you can look forward to, uh, not just with 21H2, but also with our 22H2 feature update a year later, and so on. Uh, this is our vision for an always up-to-date uh, hypervisor host for Azure Stack HCI. Now the 21H2 feature update I can say is less than two months away. We're getting really close. Uh, I'm looking forward to being able to talk even more about some of the things that are in this update. I'm looking forward to the day that it goes live and anyone who has a current cluster that's currently subscribed is able to get this update. And it's coming very, very soon. So, uh, Definitely stay tuned for that. There are also going to be a handful of more surprises. And so I think it's important to acknowledge, right? What I've described here so far is information uh, that for the most part uh, is public. Most of it is things that are in public preview that are coming to Azure Stack HCI over the course of the rest of this year. Uh, but there are a few more things that we haven't talked about and then unfortunately I'm not at liberty to talk about today. 
um, but that you should stay tuned for as we move toward the 21H2 feature update and beyond. Now, I, some of you have probably put two and two together already here, but when I say that we're less than two months away, uh, you, you may have noticed like our biggest conference of the year is also less than two months away. And so I think you can probably guess at our schedule here. Um, Microsoft Ignite Virtual Conference. This was actually recently announced. Um, it, it's completely virtual. There's unfortunately no in-person component, um, but it's November 2nd to 4th of 2021. And so uh, if you're eager to hear uh, all of what's new for Azure, including Azure services like Azure Stack HCI, I encourage you to register for Microsoft Ignite. You can do that at myignite.microsoft.com. And certainly information that's specific to Azure Stack HCI uh, I and others on the team will be you know, tweeting about and writing blogs about as we get closer to Microsoft Ignite. This is a very significant milestone for us, and I think you can probably guess when the 21H2 feature update is going to be available. I do want to give one final, I guess, hint, for lack of a better word, at uh, some of the things that we're going to be talking about as we get to Ignite. Um, all throughout this presentation, I've been talking about really two big pillars of our strategy with Azure Stack HCI, bringing Azure management innovation to HCI and bringing Azure host and hypervisor innovation to HCI. And I gave you some examples, right? I talked about multi-cluster monitoring with log analytics, and I talked about kernel soft reboot, which we use to save like millions of minutes a year in Azure, and we're really excited to bring that savings to folks on-prem too. There's a third pillar of our strategy that we're gonna be talking about for the first time at Ignite this year. Um, that we're calling Azure workloads and Azure benefits that are coming to Azure Stack HCI. And um, there's a bit of a hint on the slide as to one of the big announcements that will be part of that. But unfortunately, I can't say more right now. So uh, you'll have to stick around, stay tuned, uh, and definitely tune into Microsoft Ignite in November. Okay, so that's what I wanted to cover in this roadmap session. Um, I hope that this was valuable information for you. Uh, just to recap briefly, right? We talked about the Azure strategy, uh, the role of Azure Stack HCI within Azure's strategy, how that has shifted from being all about migrating to cloud to now being a, a much broader strategy that includes uh, innovation at the edge and on-prem and in hybrid. Uh, we talked about sort of specifically how Azure Stack HCI fits into that. Some of the big themes for us, including management innovation and hypervisor host innovation that are coming to Azure Stack HCI. And then, uh, the updates uh, in the 21H2 feature update and the lifecycle that you can expect, not only for 21H2, but also for feature updates thereafter, like 22H2. And uh, yeah, a quick look ahead at uh, reasons you should stay tuned uh, throughout the year. So like I said, there'll be more details on almost everything I've talked about over the course of the remainder of this event, uh, an incredible lineup of speakers. Uh, and kudos and thank you to Karsten and the organizers again for both having me here and for having all of us here uh, to talk about Azure Stack HCI. Um, but with that, that's the content that I had wanted to cover. So thank you all very much. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Cosmos, thanks Cosmos, for, for, the for the session. session. No, I have an echo. Oh, I, have an echo. I think the I think echo, echo, echo is from, from Cosmos from side. Cosmos is this possible? Why should it? Yeah, so so, so it's done. Muted, but I, th I think uh, Cosmos is still in the session. If we, I, I hope so. Yeah, so okay. thank you, Cosmos, for the great session and the great teasers for things to come that you can't talk about. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to ignite to learn more. Cosmos, have you still time for some uh, questions? Uh, two or three questions, maybe, or have you to go now? Yeah, absolutely. I I have until the end of the hour. Cool. So one question was cost a uh, cost for arc extension mostly free mostly costly like an app store i know this is asking you to be a fortune teller but if you could speak to what that future might look like yeah definitely that's a great question actually um so the and, and uh luckily <laughs> there's actually a really simple answer so uh the cost for these extensions is going to be the same as in Azure. And so if something is free and included in Azure, it will be free and included on Azure Stack HCI um, in terms of these extensions, things like management tools and so on, right? Uh, and if a management tool or an extension is paid, 
uh, in Azure, then that same cost, uh, usually that's because there's a real cost for us to deliver that service behind the scenes. So that same cost will apply on Azure Stack HCI. And so I can give like two examples. Um, Azure Site Recovery, if you uh, set that up for a virtual machine in Azure, there's a certain cost structure. Basically, you pay for uh, the storage in a storage account. Uh, you don't pay for the VM, the, for the replica VM, unless it's running. And I believe there is a flat rate fee, which I think is 25 US dollars a month, if I'm not mistaken, for site recovery itself. Um, that fee structure is the same if you set up site recovery for either an HCI host or for a virtual machine on HCI. Um, I'll give a different example. Azure Policy Guest Configuration. This is an interesting one because it's actually provided for free in Azure. It's a built-in part of having your workloads in Azure that you can apply guest configuration centrally. Um, it is normally something that's actually charged for. It's uh, six US dollars a month per node outside of Azure, but it is free on Azure Stack HCI. Um, and that is something that we'll be talking about as part of the sort of Azure benefits um, narrative is that our pricing for all of these extensions, it, the, the short answer is it's just the same as Azure. So if something's free in Azure, it's free here. If something's charged in Azure, it's charged here. Um, it's probably about 50-50 if you look at that slide of the ones I was hinting at, which ones are are free. So like in Azure, run command is free. Uh, Windows Admin Center in the portal is free. Uh, log analytics is paid. Site recovery is paid. Guest configuration is free. Yeah, it's about 50-50. Um, and that'll be the same on HCI. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So then I have a question from Martin. Martin is, of course, uh, I think a Microsoft service provider. So he asked if there is maybe a management white paper or guideline how an MS MSP can manage more customers with Azure Stack HCI. It's a great, I love that question. So the, the short answer is unfortunate, which is like right now the answer is no, we don't have a great white paper that explains this. Uh, but as we as we move in the direction of ARC enabling Azure Stack HCI more and more, and so you know today we talked about ARC enabling the host and some of the things you can do there. But as we add the ARC resource bridge, and especially as Kubernetes adoption increases and we have more and more folks with ARC enabled VMs and ARC enabled Kubernetes, um, it makes a ton of sense to uh, take advantage of Azure Lighthouse. Uh, which for folks who may not be aware, that's like a capability where a, an integrator or an MSP can actually see and, and potentially manage, depending on the customer's choices, resources on behalf of the customer from the portal. It makes a ton of sense to extend that Azure Lighthouse technology and those management capabilities to Azure Stack HCI. So we definitely have a, a person on my team working on this. Like it's a it's something we're very interested in. Um, but as of right now, we don't have a good white paper for it. But uh, there's also like we're not getting in the way of it. There's nothing preventing it. So if you are able to I hate to say this, but if you are able to figure it out yourself for how ARC allows you to do this, then uh, it's certainly supported. You can do it. OK, uh, next question I have. Uh, that's maybe a difficult one. Uh, what happened to Azure Stack? I think the the questionnaire uh, means Azure Stack Hub. Is Azure Stack HCI the only option left to have compute on, on prem Azure wise? How is Azure Stack Hub different to Azure Stack HCI? Yeah, OK, good question. So uh, we have a family of products with Azure Stack today. We have Azure Stack Hub, we have Azure Stack Edge, and we have Azure Stack HCI. They are all quite different from each other, actually. And so Azure Stack Hub uh, is unique relative to the other ones in that it does not uh, actually connect to Azure in the way that I've described. Like you don't go to the public cloud Azure portal to manage your Azure Stack Hub. Instead, you actually get a fully self-contained autonomous little Azure region of your own. Um, where you have a local instance of the Azure Resource Manager, a local instance of the portal. Um, and as a result, it has a somewhat larger footprint and a somewhat higher price tag uh, compared to some of the other members of the family. Uh, Azure Stack Edge is almost the, the extreme other end, right? So it's a Microsoft managed first party uh, hardware appliance that you can use to run containers. Uh, and going forward, you'll probably be able to do a little bit more than that. Um, but it's really focused on kind of simplicity. So it's a single node. It's not highly available. The networking is therefore very, sim uh, very straightforward. Um, and it's completely managed from the portal. So there's uh, almost no local management capability at all. And then Azure Stack HCI, of course, I talked about here. So they are quite different from each other. Uh, and we are very excited to have that, uh, that much choice for customers in the portfolio to have the different members of the Stack family. 
Uh, I do think that over time, um, you will see changes in how we position the different products and how we emphasize different products. Uh, and probably the person you'll be hearing from about that is me. So maybe that's a hint. Um, but as of today, um, it's definitely the case that all of those products are uh, a really important part of the portfolio. We see, I mean, let me be clear, every single month we see new deployments of all three of those products uh, and the customers are very happy in most cases. Uh, and they're, they're just, they cater to very different use cases, right? You, you can use Azure Stack Hub completely disconnected, completely autonomous with a full local ARM instance. That's an incredible capability that there really is no alternative for that in the market. Um, and the first party hardware subscription through Azure with Azure Stack Edge is also a pretty unique capability that uh, not many other folks are offering. So they all bring something a little bit different and we have a portfolio approach. Um, and if you just make sure you follow me on Twitter, then if anything changes, you'll definitely hear about it. Okay, so <laughs> another guy asks, I, I think I got the question twice over the day. Uh, when will we get to deploy HCI across <laughs> three sites? So the question about a three site uh, stretch cluster, is, it, is there something in the works there or will you stay at two sites? Uh, great question. So uh, John Marlin, uh, whom if you're a, someone who uses stretch clusters or storage replica, you've probably heard of John Marlin before. He's the he's a, a colleague of mine at Microsoft who's the PM responsible for these scenarios. Uh, he's very interested in feedback and requirements and um, sort of scenario examples for uh, new features like three site capability with a stretched cluster. Uh, it's definitely something that we're open to. Like, a, it's not that we're not going to do it. It's not that for some reason we're dead. We're you know steadfast on staying at two sites. Um, I will say though, it isn't a capability in the 21H2 feature update, and so it's not something that's going to be here this fall. Um, we're still we're gathering feedback. We're gathering input. Uh, if if you haven't, I encourage you to um, you know make your voice heard as you're doing now, and <laughs> make sure that Microsoft knows and that John knows that you want that capability. Uh, and it's it's for sure something that we can add in the future. This is one of the great things about Azure Stack HCI is when I say the future, I don't mean four years from now, right? We have an update every year. It's not in 21 H2, but the next update is just a year away in 22 H2. <laughs> okay, um, then I had some questions about GP, uh, GPU support. Uh, I hinted the session this night at 10, 10 p.m., but maybe you want to give a little bit insight for the guys who are sleeping at that time already. And the sessions will be recorded, so they will be available afterwards, of course. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, so I can briefly summarize the state of play with respect to GPUs. So uh, in Not too 21... Much, only tease it. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, it, it, simply put, in 21H2, uh, we've added the ability to attach uh, a GPU to a highly available virtual machine, a clustered virtual machine. What that means is uh, you can do discrete device assignment and take a whole GPU and assign it to a VM that is participating in a cluster. And uh, a bunch of scenarios that would have previously not worked at all work now. And so you can take that VM and uh, like if the node that it's hosted on fails, that VM will just start on another node and it will actually automatically assign itself to the GPU on that node if there's a GPU available. And there's a whole concept of GPU pools, which I'm sure Alvin and Persid will talk about later today for how you manage that. Um, and that's a big new management investment for us. So we'll have to talk a lot about the concepts behind GPU pools and the UI for GPU pools and the PowerShell commands and everything like that. Um, so you can have an automatic failover between nodes of a workload that has a GPU attached. This is a big deal because a lot of folks who are deploying like machine learning workloads to like, for example, a grocery store to like, you know, scan um, video feeds, for example. Uh, it's pretty important. I mean, it's, it's just one workload. It's just one big VM that needs a GPU, but it does need to be highly available, right? The whole point is to have a two node cluster in the store. And so this is the, this is the scenario that this addresses really well. Uh, you can also do things like drain the node. And if you've configured the shutdown action or the, the drain action to be shut down for that VM, then the VM will gracefully shut down and you can successfully like pause and drain a clustered node for maintenance, which means you can do a cluster or updating run, even though you have workloads that had GPUs attached. Everything I've just described would have like not worked in the past. <laughs> so okay. that's some of the so that's some of the innovations there. Now we have a longer term roadmap around GPUs. Um, everyone is just waiting for me to say the word partitioning, so I'll say it. Um, but over the course <laughs> of 22H2 and 23H2 and beyond, 
uh, we'll definitely be continuing to invest every single release in significant new capabilities for GPUs. But our focus in this in 21H2 is, and you'll hear this from Alvin and Persid and others later, our focus is really around um, a GPU that's DDA attached to a VM. That VM, even though it's clustered, it can it can still basically fully participate in the cluster, even though it has a GPU, which didn't used to work at all before, so now it works. 